Hey everybody, Koibu here, and I want to talk to you about the new Monstrous Manual that just came out for 5th edition. I got my hands on one, and I'm going to kind of go through it and give you my thoughts on it. Because um, I've been asked a lot about my thoughts on the Monstrous Manual. So, without further ado, let's, let's just jump right in. First thing on the, the topic is the artwork. Now, let's take a look, because this is going to answer all of our questions about artwork. Let's take a look at the 5th edition Goblin artwork, right? Ah, that's a pretty decent goblin. You know, it's not quite what I expect. I expect like something reddish or greenish. He's got a lot of metal armor or whatever. It's a goblin. Goblins are cool. Let's take a look for reference, because you know, you know, my second edition is my heart and my home. Let's take a look at the second edition goblin for comparison. Oh yeah. Oh, you can't even get that, can you? Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's that pretty drawn outside the or colored outside the lines goblin that we've been used to. So the, the look, this is a joke. The artwork in 5th edition is fantastic. Like, we could look at anything in here, and all of the artwork is just phenomenal. It's, it's perfect. I love the artwork in 5th edition. It's much, much better than 2nd edition. And it's better than 3rd, and it's a little bit better. Well, it's comparable to 4th-ish, whatever. It, it's great artwork. Love it. Five stars for the artwork. Um, let's talk about the, the monster descriptions, though. And I want to pull up a very specific example here. Uh, the Grell. For example, if you don't know what a grell is, think about a brain with a beak attached to it and tentacles coming down from underneath it. And you know what? Considering the artwork is so good, we can even show you some pictures of grell. If I can open the right page. Here we go. So, on the one hand, we've got this, you know, ooh, it's on this page. Other page. we got this guy. You know, brain with a beak and things coming out of it. Nice, nice grell. More or less the same thing that we get over here with the second edition. Uh... It's just too shiny. The pages are too damn shiny. Whatever. It's the same thing. They're Grell, right? But my problems when it comes to monster descriptions, um, I have I have some problems with the way the 5th edition camp books handle monster descriptions. 5th uh, edition uses kind of like a size. If a Grell, a Grell has, uh, uses hit points in terms of D8s, you know, so Grell has 10 D8 plus 10 HP. So the D8 tells you that it's a medium-sized creature. Um, a d6 tells you that it's a small creature, a d4 tells you it's a tiny creature, a d10 means large, a d12 means huge, and a d20 means gargantuan, right? So you have like a nice uh, breakdown of monster sizes by hit dice. It doesn't actually tell you how big a grell is, it just says it's, it has d8 hit points, or uses d8's four hit points, so it's a medium-sized creature. Now, a medium-sized creature is a pretty broad range. That could be like a four-foot tall grell, could be an eight-foot tall grell, Maybe not eight, but like if you could, you know, the tentacles, yeah, probably eight feet tall. I don't know. Who knows, right? Second edition campaign is, or the second edition monstrous manual is really nice. It has, oh, grill, size, medium, four feet in diameter. Okay, so you roughly have, from top to bottom, it's like a four foot floating thingy. Awesome. Now we know it's kind of like the smallest creature. Um, the grill here, just, it's a medium sized creature. This is, doesn't seem like a big thing, but this is the first. It's the first evidence I noticed of this continuing trend throughout that we'll be getting to, which is offering the minimum that you need to make the creature function, and then just kind of expecting everyone else to fill it on their own, which is fine. We'll get to that a little bit later. But the descriptions, for example, here we have, what does it say for Grell? It says, Grell resemble blah blah blah. It gives a physical description. In addition to the picture, it, it talks about what they look like. And then it goes into, you know, uh, blah, 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 blah. So it talks about the, the visual appearance. It has no eyes and it floats by means of sort of levitation. They have keen hearing and their skin is sensitive to vibrations and electrical fields. So you're giving like very detailed information about how the creature functions, which is nice and absolutely needed. I love having that bit of information. Um, although solitary by nature, grell, or by nature, grell sometimes gather in small groups called covens. Fine. Then it talks about floating ambushers. They prefer to ambush lone creatures and stragglers, hovering silently near the ceiling or of a passage or a cavern until a suitable target passes below. Blah, blah, blah. It talks about alien devourer, grell or alien predators that group uh, other creatures into three categories, edible, inedible, and the great eaters, you know, the people that eat grell, blah, blah, blah. Um, but that's pretty much all it gives for descriptions. On the other hand, what I'm used to, what I think is the better system, well, I shouldn't say better system, but the better system for descriptions, is here we have like a page, like, whoops, here we have like half a page of text. You can't see it because of the shine, but the stat block ends about here, and this is all description about the grell. On the other side, for the fifth edition books, we have 
a nice big picture. Oops. We have a little blurb, some description, some description, stat block, right? So we don't actually have very much room for descriptions, and the descriptions actually are pretty weak. Over here, we have all sorts of wonderful stuff about habits and ecology, how they affect the world around them, how they, you know, work together, with, if they do work together, how they do all these, like, it gives a whole bunch of depth of the creature, which kind of brings us into our third section, lore. The, the monster descriptions are pretty good here. They physically describe them, you know, minus the actual how big they are sort of thing. But when we start getting into, like, the descriptions plus their habits plus their blah, 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 which we're just kind of calling lore, it falls short a lot. Um, the first example here that we're going to take a look at in terms of why the, how the lore is so bad is with uh, dragons, because everyone loves dragons. Hell, it's even in the name of the damn game. So, taking a look at dragon information in 5th edition, real quick, like. Um, well, uh, whoops, next page. Ha, 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 ha. Here we go. We have a full page, well, we have three quarters of a page devoted to just information about dragons before we even get into any dragon stats, which is perfect. You love that sort of stuff. There's like a little extra rule in here, variant about dragons and spellcasters and a little artwork on the side. And they talk kind of about their, the core concepts of dragons. They're driven by greed. They're creatures of ego. They've got dangerous lairs. And then there's a section about Tia mapping the queen of evil dragons, which is the like official D&D lore. Cause D&D kind of has developed this pantheon of gods and this, semi-persistent, not I wouldn't want to call it a persistent world, but they give you all the tools to run your own world. Like, here's your gods. These dragons worship this god. This thing, like, they kind of, um, well, you know, we're actually going to get to that. We're gonna, they'll be in the summary at the end. I'm not gonna, anyway, so the point is, you got a descriptions of dragons in general, and then when you come to the actual dragon pages, uh, there's not that much detail on them. There's some, you know, but there's there's not a ton. I, I find myself reading through the dragon section being a little bit like, well, mm, okay, it's fine. It, it, it's There's information, but there's not that much. When you read, well, when we go back and take a look at second edition dragons, the I find that the descriptions about what they do, how they impact the world around them, makes a lot, uh, makes a big difference. Like, the, the way they interact with individuals. Let's just take, I actually haven't read this section, so I might just eat all of my words right now, but I'm gonna, I'm betting on the fact that I'm not. All right, let's take a look at brass dragons in particular, all right? Brass dragons are good creatures. They're good dragons, blah, blah, blah. Okay, boldly talkative. Brass dragons engage in conversations with thousands of creatures throughout its long life, accumulating useful information which it will gradually share for, or gladly share for gifts of treasure. If an intelligent creature tries to leave a brass dragon's presence without engaging in conversation, the dragon follows it. If the creature attempts to escape by magic or force, the dragon might respond with a fit of peak, using its sleep gas to incapacitate the creature. Blah, blah, blah. So it talks about, you know, like they're talkative, they prize, trager, or prize treasures. Brass dragons convert magic items that allow them to converse, or covet magic items that allow them to converse with interesting personalities. Intelligent telepathic weapon or a magic lamp with a djinn bound inside are among the greatest treasures the brass dragon possess, blah, blah, blah. And then it just talks about their lairs and a little bit about, this is nice, the dragons actually do have regional effect lists. You know, what what happens in when there's a dragon in the area, which they don't have for Grell or for any other monsters, really, that I've noticed. I haven't read the whole thing cover to cover. Um, over here, though, if we go to brass dragons, and I might just be eating my words, because that's actually a lot more descriptive than I expected. Uh, having lo looked through the book. Um, here we go. So, over here, instead, we, after we get out of combat stuff, we go to bronze dragons like to appear near deep. Are we doing bronze? No, brass. Oops. Let's do brass. And I, they don't have to have the exact same descriptions, of course. Brass dragons are found in arid, warm climates, ranging from sandy deserts to dry steppes. They talk about... Do they talk about brass dragon layers? Metallic dragon, layers, bra <clears throat> brass dragon's lair is uh, typically a ruined canyon or cave network with ceilings, ceiling holes to allow for sunlight. Does it actually say where they like to live though? Let's take a look. I'm not... I'm not seeing anything in here. Lair actions. 
in the lair actions, I talk about sand. Uh, oh, wait, hold on. A brass dragon. Brass dragons crave constant, uh, crave conversation, sunlight, and hot, dry climates. Okay. So they like hot, dry climates. We do get that. But over here, we have the whole, well, they actually prefer da, 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 arid, warm climates ranging from sandy deserts to dry steppes. So mo mostly kind of the same thing in terms of where they're found. They love intense, dry heat and spend most of the time basking in the sun. They lair in high caves, preferably facing east, where the sun can warm the rocks, and on their and their territories always contain several spots where they can bask and trap unwary travelers into conversation. That's the sort of detail and description and lore that I really enjoy. Because here, we talk about the brass dragon, you know, talking about how it wants to talk with people, they love chatting with people, um, they prize treasures, especially those that help them talk to people, and it talks about their lair and the regional effects. Traxpeer, original effects containing a legendary brass dragon's lair is wrapped with by the dragon's magic, which creates one of the more following effects. Okay, that's a legendary brass dragon's lair, but whatever. Tracks appear in the sand within six miles of the dragon's lair. The tracks lead to safe shelters and hidden water source while also leading away from the areas that the dragon prefers to remain undisturbed. Images of large or smaller monsters hunt the desert in the sands within one mile of the dragon's lair. These illusions move and appear real, although they do no harm. The creature that examines an area from the distance can tell it's an illusion with a successful DC-20 intelligence check. Any physical interaction with an image reveals it to be an illusion because the objects pass through it. Blah, blah, blah. So, it says the dragon's going to kind of protect its area by creating tracks and illusions. But it doesn't really say the kind of areas it likes. Or, you know, it doesn't give that extra little bit of detail. Um, because they share this, in, back in the second edition now, because they share the same habitat, blue dragons and blast dragons are often worst enemies. Brass dragons usually get the worst of the one-on-one confrontation, mostly because of the longer reach of the blue dragon's breath weapon. Because of this, brass dragons usually try to evade blue dragons until they can rally for their neighbors for a mass attack. Like other dragons, brass dragons can and will eat almost anything if the need rises. In practice, however, they eat very little. They are able to get nourishment from morning dew, a rare commodity in their habitat, and have been seen carefully lifting off plants with their, little, with their long tongues. So, when we're coming to lore here, the 5th edition does a lot of what it's already been doing. It gives you the bare details for things to function. I, I do really actually enjoy the part about creating these illusions um, that would keep people aware from, away from stuff. That, that's actually really useful. That's something I, I would have loved to see in the 2nd edition Monsters Manual. But I find that it's a little bit short on information. It's, a it's missing the... How am I supposed to say? You know what? We're gonna, uh, this is all kind of revolving around the same thing that we're going to reach at the end. I don't want to jump the gun here. Let's move on, still talking about lore and that sort of thing, to golems, okay? Because golems are pretty cool. Now, again, with the information stuff, we have, what? Golems take up one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pages for two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 13 different golems take up 8 pages in 2nd edition. And in 5th edition, we have 1, 2, 3, 4 golems that take up 1, 2, 3, 4 pages. Alright, so the golem per page count is better. Yeah, much better. Uh, however, we will notice that the actual golem pages, like a clay golem, is a picture and a stat block. Flesh golem is a picture and a stat block. Uh, iron Golem and Stone Golem share a page and they're a picture and a stat block, right? And then we have a full page just discussing golems in, whoops, that's goblins, golems in general over here, right? And there's a little bit of breakdown. There's a paragraph and a half on clay golems, two paragraphs on flesh golems, two paragraphs on iron golems, and paragraph and a half on stone golems, right? Well, I'm not super psyched about this because really the only things I talk about golems, which I, one of the reasons I like golems is because they don't have habit or society or lore or stuff like that because they're constructs, they don't exist naturally. It will say, you know, it kind of gives you a breakdown. They're ageless guardians, they have blind obedience, they uh, are construct of a constructed nature and they're elemental spirit in material form. You know, that, that sort of thing makes sense, okay? But over here in what well, I am really sad to see missing is the descriptions of how golems are formed. Second edition tells you how to form each different type of golem if you want. For example, 
Let's say you want to make a scarecrow. Scarecrows can be created either by using special manual, uh, by a special manual, or by a god answering the plea of a priest employing the following spells: animate object, prayer, command, and quest. The final process is casting the quest spell. This is done during a new moon, right? Or let's say um, doll golem. The spells needed to complete this animation are imbued with spell ability, Tasha's uncontrollable hideous laughter, unholy word, bless, prayer. Every golem has a description of how the golem is created. They talk about like the very the the different thing parts of the golem. For example, scarecrows can be constructed to kill a specific person. To do so, the clothes worn by the scarecrow must come from the intended victim. Once the scarecrow is, scarecrow is animated, the priest needs only utter a single word: quest. The scarecrow then moves in a direct line towards the being with uh, and concentrates its gaze and attacks entirely on the person until it has uh, on the person it has been created to kill. After slaying the victim, the scarecrow's magic dissipates and collapses into dust. There's like a nice section on the scarecrow. Now, there's also the Scarecrow page of Golems that I may have even more information, because that's the little blurb at the beginning. Um, over here, Scarecrows are enchanted creatures made from the same material as normal Scarecrows, although blah blah blah, blah blah blah, blah blah blah, blah 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 blah, just talking about like physical descriptions mostly. And then you have like some combat stuff, but you know, the combat blocks here are more, they're just as good as the combat stuff over here, I think. Um, they, they may not be the same, but the, the details on how things work in combat are pretty good. The stat blocks from 5th edition are fantastic for combat. Uh, they are missing a little bit of kind of descriptions in combat style and how they like to behave in combat, which might be different than other monsters, which is a little bit sad, but we're, about, we're not in combat yet. We're getting to combat. Actually, this is a perfect segue to our combat discussion, but let's wrap up the, golem, uh, the lore discussion first. Um, I find 5th edition lore to be pretty incomplete. It's nice knowing why, like, you know, the dragon likes to bask in the sun. Oh, okay, they usually have west-facing things. Oh, okay, that's nice, you know, that sort of thing. And before we, we move on to combat, and let's not forget the golems, because that's an, our, our nice segue into combat here. Um, the issue I find with 5th edition is that they say, here's how you run combat with these monsters. You can make up whatever lore you want. And I've made these comments, and a lot of people have gotten back to me being like, you know what, I like making up my own information about these monsters. I kind of really only need the combat blocks. Everything else I can do on my own. Who cares if they're missing, you know, this one in interpretation of things? And my, my problem with that is, you're right, you're right. You don't need lore regarding these creatures. You can make up your own lore. That's half the fun of playing D&D, right, is making up the stuff. However, it's really nice to have suggestions to have tools, to have these sorts of things like, well, here's kind of how we figure they function and act in the world. And you can ignore all of this, or you can use parts of it, but here's like some interesting information where we were coming from when we designed this creature or when we invented this creature. You know, this is kind of how we thought they were gonna function. And you kind of lack a lot of that in fifth edition. You get the, it's the dragon. It lives in hot, arid places. It will disguise its lair by using its footsteps. Awesome. It will do these things. It will try and talk to people. Awesome. But then there's no, like, they have this, and they have a animosity with blue dragons. They, um, you know, they like to bask out in the sun in these places. They, they like to do, oh, fuck, I forgot everything I said. But what we were talking about earlier is you lack the depth of information on care, on monsters and characters and, like, figuring out who they are a little bit more beyond just how they function in combat. Um, and that's kind of the problem. And I know people are saying you don't need it, but it's nice having those tools that you can choose to use or not use. So, moving on to combat. Uh, well, we were just talking about golems in combat and how, in addition, not just with golems, with all creatures, second edition kind of tells you how they work in combat. Not just like what abilities they have, but what they like to do and that sort of thing. So we're gonna take a look at orcs now. A very Another very common monster that you might use everywhere. Um, most particularly when relating to combat, we're going to take a look at this section over here in the second edition book. Again, not not fifth edition. You know, no, we'll start with the fifth edition. We'll start with the fifth edition. Um, the fifth edition says orc gives you the stats on the orc, you know, 2d8 plus 6 hit dice, armor class 13, hide armor, you know, um, intimidation has a plus 2, the, they speak common and orc, they all speak common and orc, um, and, you know, here's their stats, Strength, Xcon, Intel, Wiz, Charisma, blah, blah, blah. Here's their actions, they're aggressive, they use a Great Axe, which is plus 5 to hit, and they hit for D12 plus 3 damage, and then they can also use this Javelin. 
boom, there's your orc, your, your standard orc combat is all down to this one little tiny box right here. This is, this is how an orc works in combat. Whereas what I really like over here in second edition is this broad section. It's not just the orc combat section is, well, the stat block up here, but it's also this block of text from here down to here down to here. It's this huge section on how orcs work in combat. And specifically, we see over here that orcs in fifth edition use like a great axe, D12 plus three. But that means all orcs use a great axe, D12 plus three, right? Of course you can house rule it. You can say, you know what? This orc isn't using a great axe. He's using a spear or he's using a blah, blah, blah. But what's really nice about second edition is that under how much damage they deal, like the stat block for second edition, just says D8 damage by weapon type, right? And then lower it says, well, the orc breakdown of weapon goes this way, and it gets actually admittedly way the fuck out of hand. 5% use sword and flail, 10% use sword and spear, 10% use axe and spear, 10% use axe and polearm, 10% use axe and crossbow, 10% use axe and bow, 5% use sword and battle axe, 10% use spear, 10% use axe, and 20% use polearm. Like, that is a ridiculous breakdown, and there's no way in hell I'm going to like roll on each of those tables to see what each what each orc is fighting with. Like that's that's ridiculous. You don't need that much information. But knowing that that's kind of their weapon preference is nice. Oh my god, I totally misread. No, the combat section I lied to you is actually only from here down to here. This is actually habit and society. Oops, sorry. It's actually only from here to here. It is not the section and the next page. That's all habit society. But. We, we still have a nice big chunk of text discussing orcs in combat. So when we get to further on, pole arms are typically halibreds, pikes, blah, blah, blah. Uh, leaders typically possess two weapons. If a sub chief, if, if a sub chief, if a sub chief is present, there's a 40% chance the orcs will be fighting around a standard. The presence of the standards increase attack rolls and morale by plus one for all orcs within 60 yards. Okay, a semi-magic effect that all orcs function around. There's no mention of that over here. That doesn't have to be, like, that doesn't have to exist in the 5th edition World of Orcs. Um, but it's... Well, let's keep going. Um, orcs hate direct sunlight and fight at minus one penalty to their attack rolls. That is noted over here in... in I swear I saw it over here. No. Nope. No. You know what? Take it back. Orcs are no longer nocturnal creatures, I guess. Because there's no mention of orcs in sunlight. Okay. Well, there was another creature in there that mentioned in bright light it fights at minus two to hit or something like that. So that that's, I guess that's just a difference in how orcs work these days. Um, well, let's keep going. Um, orcs employ, employ sniping and ambush tactics in the wild. They do not obey the rules of war unless such is in their best interest. For example, they will shoot at those who attempt to parlay with them under a white flag unless the orc leader feels it's advantageous to hear what the enemy has to say. They abuse him, human rules of engagement and chivalry to their best advantage. They have a historic enmity against elves and dwarves. Many tribes will kill these dead humans on sight. It is often believed orcs are so bloodthirsty and cruel that they are ineffective tacticians that they would rather be victorious or vicious than victorious. Like most stereotypes, this is highly misleading. It is true for some orc tribes, but not for all. Many orcs tribes have waged wars for decades and have developed a frightening efficiency in battle tactics. So you know what? It's a bunch of information about how orcs like to fight and the theory, the, the mind of orcs coming into combat. And over here, what do we got? We've got savage riders with... Uh, savage raiders and pillages with stooped postures, low foreheads, piggish faces, and prominent lower canines that, that resemble tusks. Orcs worship Groomish, the mightiest of the orc deities and their creator, blah, blah, blah. That's nice having that sort of thing. Tribes like plagues, orcs gather in tribes that exert their dominance and satisfy their blood lost on wandering uh, by plundering villages, devouring and driving off roaming herds, and slaying any humanoids that stand against them. After savaging a settlement, orcs pick a clean of wealth and items usable in their lands. They set the remains of villages and camps ablaze. Then retreat once they came, their blood lust satisfied. Raging scavengers. Uh, their lust for slaughter demands orc dwellings always within striking distance of new targets. As such, they seldom settle permanently, instead converting ruins, caverns, complexes, complexes, and defeating uh, defeated foes, villages, into fortified camps, strongholds. Only Orcs only build for defense, making no innovation or improvement to the lairs beyond 
mounting the sacred uh, silver body parts of their victims on spiked stockade walls and pikes jutting from moats and trenches. Leadership might, or cross speeds, blah, blah, blah. So they kind of reduce the orcs from these, you know, savage and bloodthirsty and ruthless people, but who are still like frighteningly smart tacticians and clever and there's these rumors about them just being these worthless blood or these uh, blood lusted people who can't do anything but kill 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 and move on and kill some more to actually just what people had rumored them to be before now orcs are according to the lore are just you know crazy people who just like to kill which is fine because we've discussed before you can't ignore the lore you don't have to stick with lore but what i'm getting at with orcs here is that how do you it's difficult for me to express my thoughts because they're so disjointed, but I find orcs to be very dissatisfying. The second edition says D8 for weapons, and then lists the type, sorts of weapons they use. Now, some of those weapons, of course, don't do a damage, don't do D8 damage, but you can, you know, change that out, whatever. And in fifth edition, it just says D12 plus blah, blah, blah. It doesn't list the possibilities of other weapons, but a good DM, of course, will kind of ignore that and grab other weapons for their orcs. I guess... What I'm trying to say is that there is nothing in the 5th edition that ruins the game. The 5th edition Monsters Manual is a fine Monsters Manual. It gives you all the information that you need to run your combat. It needs all the information that you need to kind of like get your monsters out there and get them working. And it's fine. It's great. It's fantastic. It's a good Monsters Manual. I do like it. I do enjoy it. This whole discussion, I've just been... My point is that I feel they have cut out a lot of secondary material that is very useful you know knowing that orcs like these various combinations of weapons for example is really nice i don't need to roll on the table to be like okay this orc is using an axe and spear but this next orc is using just a sword and a battle axe useful who cares about that that's not the important thing the important thing is that it gives you ideas to build and take the orcs beyond what you have here into something better the, this uh, has Second edition gives you a stat block, and then gives you ideas to expand that stat block. Fifth edition gives you a stat block and ideas to to support, but not expand that stat block. That's what I'm getting at here, and that's the pattern I find throughout the fifth edition monsters manual. I again, I haven't read it cover to cover. I've just kind of skimmed through and read sections of monsters that I'm familiar with from second edition. Blah blah blah, and I I really feel that I feel like it they could have done a better job. That this is very good for 5th edition, but that it would have been nice to have a little bit more lore, a little bit more material that opens up the world, that opens up things. Um, earlier I was mentioning... Actually, I didn't mention that here. Uh, the other creature I wanted to talk about that we didn't actually get to look at in the book is the kobold. Um, and the kobold... Apparently this was back in 3rd edition, but I, I didn't play 3rd. So kobolds have been changed from dog-like, canine-like creatures to kind of lizard creatures. But according to the 5th edition stats, they're pretty much the same as goblins. They have a little less HP, they do must the same damage, they get like advantage for other kobolds being near, but they're kind of just small creatures that, you know, do standard damage. They Kobolds have lost a lot. And this is just a symptom of something. I'm not, I'm not trying to say we really need the kobolds to be like this, because the kobolds have to act this way, because monsters change, you know? You come up with a new edition of a book, you scrap one idea of this monster, and you bring in a new idea. Like, they're reptilian instead of canine noun. Whatever. You know, it's a change, who cares? I can just lure it the other way. No, haha. DM says kobolds are still canine creatures instead of direct, uh, reptilian creatures. Perfect, you know? But the issue I find is that we... We're lacking a lot of low-end monsters. And that might be because 5th edition is kind of designed around for characters... 5th edition is designed for characters 3rd level and higher, you know? The the books kind of say, once you're used to playing 5th edition, you know, you've played through once or twice, just start at 3rd level, ignore levels 1 and 2 completely. Which represents a very different philosophy of D&D than I share, but that's fine. Um, but we lack that low end of low end of the, the, the area. Like, kobolds used to be this this weak creature, D4 hit points. They're cowardly, they're afraid all the time. You know, they're, they're constantly skittering about trying to figure out how to get the best advantage because they're such small, weak, pathetic creatures that they really need to work in numbers to get anywhere. And so you, 
you used, we used to have these creatures that would always try and overpower and overrun with sheer numbers and otherwise would just flee. And now kobolds have kind of just... Now they're these... They're lizard goblins. There's nothing that separates them from goblins other than the fact that they're lizards and they worship dragons. Which, by the way... Well, we'll get to that in just a moment, too. Um, so, I feel that a lot of monsters have lost their depth. They've lost what makes them awesome. They've lost those little, like, fine jit details that really bring them to life. And that makes me sad. On the other hand, we still have the second edition book, so we can use all the lore from here and the stat blocks from here, and everything's going to be awesome. So it doesn't even matter. I would just really have liked a little bit more of this. Um, and some people are, have pointed out that, you know what? Kobolds have been reptilian since third edition, or they haven't used actual sizes. They've just used, like, small, medium, large, huge, gargantuan since third edition. And, well, that, you know what? That's true. And it's okay. You can clearly say, well, it's a medium-sized thing, and let's just call it five feet tall, or let's just call it six feet tall, when, you know, as previously you might have been given a very specific size. But it's nice having more information and more... Um, how do we say? I guess this just comes back to the depth thing. It's nice to have these suggestions that you are free to ignore and completely just toss out the window or to kind of use them as you please. And yeah, that's that's how we're going to end here, actually. Sec uh, fifth edition, Monstrous Manual, great book. Perfect for combat. Like, in terms of, I kind of, I know I've been focusing on the negatives a lot, but it's really good. It's... It gives you everything that you need to run combat. The combat abilities of monsters are fantastic. Let's go back and take a look. We're not done. We're, we're totally not done. Let's go take a look at orcs again, guys. Because here, we have this nice thing. When we're talking about orcs, um, their actions, you know, they can use their great axe or their javelin, but they're also highly aggressive, which as a bonus action, the orcs can move up to its speed towards a hostile creature that it can't see. Uh, that, no, that can see it. So, you know, that way, like, now you have these orcs that, oh, they can see people that get super aggressive and, like, start running towards them even faster than before. That's a nice little bonus, you know? It's that That's a core rule that has changed, which adds depth to gameplay, which, which I do like, you know? And the legendary actions for monsters are fantastic. Um, let's just talk about dragon legendary actions for a moment here, because they're, they're so great. There's a lot of really good things in the 5th edition. I don't want to make it sound like I'm just bitching and complaining about it. Because there are some really fantastic things. Alright, so, whereas 2nd edition dragons, you can use a breath weapon once every 3 rounds. You have, uh, what is it, like 2 claw attacks, a bite attack, and a tail attack every round. And you have some spells. Well, here we've got multi-attacks. The dragon can use its frightful presence. Uh, or this, blah, blah, blah. The dragon can use its frightful presence. Then it makes 3 attacks. One with its bite and two with its claws. And then it just gives you what each attack is like which is fantastic. It gives you all these different different types of attacks that it can do. So, you know, on one round you can do Frightful Presence and two claw attacks and a bite attack. And then on the next round, you might just use a tail attack. Or on the round after that, you'll use, like, the Fire Breath, which the regeneration for Fire Breath, or for um, Breath Weapons, is interesting. If you don't know what I'm talking about here, um, there, are we there are abilities that can be only used once until they uh, recharge, is what they call it. So... If a dragon breathes fire, each round that the dragon's turn comes back, you roll a d6, and if it's a 5 or a 6, it can breathe fire again, but not until then. Uh, which is actually pretty nice. Better than saying once per every three turns? Probably. I, I do like that variation in there. Um, but what I really wanted to talk about about dragons is when it comes down to legendary actions. Just listen. The dragon can take three legendary actions choosing from the options below. Only one legendary action can be used at a time and only uh, and only at the end of another creature's turn. The dragon regen, uh, regains spent legendary actions at the start of its own turn. One legendary action, detect. The dragon makes a wisdom perception check. Second, tail attack. The dragon makes a tail attack. Third, wing attack, but it costs two legendary action points. The dragon beats its wings. Each creature within 15 feet of the dragon make a DC 25 saving throw or take 17 or 2d6 plus 10 bludgeoning damage and be knocked prone. The dragon can then fly up to half its flying speed. So these legendary actions allow the dragon to do shit on other people's turns. So it's not the dragon's turn, but at the end of your turn, he's going to make a tail attack. And at the end of your turn, he's going to uh, try and find someone using his perception check. And then at the end of your turn, he's going to make another tail attack. So this gives the dragon its normal attacks 
plus actions on other people's rounds. Now, that may sound, you, some people might say, well, why don't you just give it more actions? No, the fantastic thing is that it's acting on your turn, and that's what really provides an interesting combat situation where you're like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to go attack this guy because his turn's over, so I can get in there and do my shit now until his next turn. No, 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 no. You can do your shit, but he's a big fucking dragon. He can interrupt your stuff. Let's say you move here and do this thing, and you're, like, trying to set up this multi-prong attack, and the dragon's like, oh, fuck. I'm just going to fly and move over here, and now your entire chain of, like, we were going to order these things in this turn in this way to affect the dragon thusly gets screwed. So the, the legendary actions of creatures being able to act on other people's turns are fantastic, which also kind of brings us into um, what would they call it, reaction? Reaction actions, where you can react to things that other people do, like opportunity attacks are reactions, and there's some spell abilities that are reactions, and this and that are reactions. So those are fantastic. Combat speaking, like in terms of combat, this is the best monstrous manual uh, that is out there for pure combat purposes only. It makes combat much more interesting. The characters, or the monsters all have interesting, unique abilities. Like, what was it? Um, bugbears automatically do double damage or something? What is that? Well, first off, let's talk about goblins. Nimble escape. The goblin can take the disengage or hide action as a bonus on the end of each turn. It makes goblins way more interesting than just, like, random guys that, you know, run around being stupid goblins that are useless because everyone hates goblins. I mean, goblins are dumb. Um, but let's quickly take a look at bugbear. If it's the same as it was in the other thing. Here we go. No. No, wait, that's light. Damn it, where's Bugbear? I know they're here somewhere. Hi, Bugbear. Um, Brute. A melee weapon deals one extra da uh, die of its damage when the Bugbear hits with it, included in the attack. So if a Bugbear hits you with a club, instead of doing d6, it does 2d6. If it hits you with a great axe, it does 2d12 instead of d12. So Bugbear's super fucking dangerous, right? Um, or let's just, I'm skipping to a random page here. Uh, no, it's a giant demon. Let's do something not quite so massive and terrifying. Let's get out of the dragons. Where's it? Where's just a standard monster? Here we go. Hobgoblin. Martial advantage. Once per turn, the hobgoblin can deal an extra 2d6 damage to a creature it hits with a weapon attack. If that creature is within 5 feet of an alley, the hobgoblin... And the... No, 5 feet of an alley, ally of the hobgoblin that isn't incapacitated. So again, hobgoblins, super damaging here. They get these extra things on top of that. What about Hobgoblin Warlord? Reaction. Parry. Hobgoblin adds three to his AC against one melee attack that would hit it. To do so, the Hobgoblin must see the attacker and be wielding a martial weapon. Extra depth in combat there. This is fantastic. These things are great. But I miss the lore. I miss the the goblins behave... You know, they're, they're, they're orcs uh, are bloodthirsty and savage and all this, but they're not completely crazy. They're not just these relentless slaughtering machines they're smart tacticians they they're focused they're careful they're you know well organized um i miss the you know bronze dragon or brass dragons like to lay out in the sun all the time they have specially devised layers for that sort of thing and they fear blue dragons and will mass with other people to fight the blue dragons and they you know they have these territory conflicts or i miss that sort of added lore and it doesn't it doesn't make them less effective in combat, but it makes them less interesting overall. Now, a good DM will overcome all of these obstacles. A good DM doesn't need that shit, but not everyone's a good DM. And it's really nice having sources to draw from for inspiration. I rarely, rarely use a monster to the book from the second edition monster Monstrous Manual. I will almost always make modifications due to the situation, due to how I perceive the world, due to I just don't like the, how this monster functions, we're gonna change it. But I use this for a lot of inspiration and it helps me kind of keep my monsters different and interesting, I feel. The fifth edition book, much better for combat than second edition, like 10,000 times better for combat than second edition, but it lacks that added world richness. I guess that's what we're going to say. So that's that's how we're going to end this. 5th edition Monstrous Manual is fantastic, but it lacks like the ri richness and depth and added innovation that we used to have. And I know a lot of these things are have been in practice since 3rd edition, but that doesn't make them good choices. Um, and that's, how we're, that's it. Thank you for watching, and I hope that when you bitch at me for Oh my god, you just don't get it. You're so stuck in your old ways, you stupid person. Uh, I hope you actually take a moment to think about what you're going to say before you do that, because there's a lot of... Fuck it. See you guys later.